1889, a man clumsies his way down a dark corridor, juggling a tripod and a heavy camera, trying to step past rotting garbage and not on the children who might be sleeping or playing in the darkness. Entering a room in the most densely populated neighborhood in the world, piled high with luggage, knickknacks, and most of all, people. A dozen or more crammed in the room without as much as a window or a faucet. Using new flash technology, he captures the lives of the people living in the world's worst slums, a world unseen and unimagined to millions of other Americans. But just what did these photos reveal about American cities and the lives of the immigrants living in them? Well, that's the treasure we're out to discover. I'm Dan Luer, and this is History for Humans. This photograph was taken by the photographer just introduced, Jacob Reese, titled Five Cent Spot. Spend a second and look around the room. What story is it telling you? Surely a picture like this is worth a thousand words, but I guess a room like this is only worth five cents a night. How many men do you count? I got seven if those are feet under the covers in the front there. But in some rooms like these, there might be sometimes as much as 16. With photos like this, Reese was trying to bring the lives of these immigrants in New York City to public attention. And if your jaw dropped at all at seeing it, then you just got Reese. That's a verb that I just made up to pay homage to my man, Jacob Reese. Anything? Anything? Ah, anyway, our exploration question for today's story lecture is, what did Jacob Reese's photos reveal about American cities and the lives of immigrants who lived there? But to answer that, pens and umbrellas out, because I got some history to rain upon you first. America had generally been a nation of farmers since the colonial days. With a seemingly limitless amount of open land, urbanization, or the growth of cities was a relatively slow process. Why crowd into a slum or an apartment and work for a boss when you could own land on the cheap and live and work in the open air? In 1860, America had only 16 cities with 50,000 or more people, but by 1890, there grew to be 11 cities with more than 250,000 and several approaching a million. New York grew to be the world's busiest harbor and the second largest city only to London and passed her by in 1920. With industrialization and new marvels of innovation, cities offered spectacles found nowhere else. Electrified streets and housing, well, at least for the wealthy. Amusement parks like Coney Island with roller coasters and games, motion pictures, professional sports, and shopping. Just as they do today, many rural Americans fled from the countryside to the cities. And then, coming by the millions, were immigrants from around the world, hoping for a better life. And that is what brought a young Jacob Reed to America's shores in 1870. Reese was born the third out of 15, yes, 15 children in Denmark. He had to work from a young age to help support his family. And at the age of 11, he decided to donate all of his money to a poor family in squalid housing, a foreshadowing of his life's great work. And then at 21 years old, with $40 in his pocket, he boarded ship for America in hopes to make his way as a carpenter in the land of opportunity. Landing in New York Harbor, the bustling city, crowded spaces, traffic-ridden streets, led Reese to spend half his money the very first day on a handgun for protection. He scoured for food, eating other people's leftovers and rotting fruit. He was homeless, sleeping in filthy avenues, freezing cold amidst criminals, gangs, and derelicts. He was close to suicide on a number of occasions, but eventually landed a job as a police reporter for the New York Tribune in the city's worst neighborhood, the Five Points, with an office on Mulberry Street. He was more prepared than most to report on criminal behaviors and the lives of the poor souls occupying the dark pits of America's slums. And what he saw over time so shook him, saying, it gripped my heart until I felt I must tell of them or burst. And that makes two of us, Reese, so let me tell of them before I burst. Now, America, of course, had always been a nation of immigrants. It was always a diverse country, but before the 1880s, it was not quite the diversity that we know today. The so-called old immigrants who had come were mostly of Northern and Western European stock. English, Germans, Irish, and some French and Scandinavians as well. Aside from the Irish, most were Protestant, and many were somewhat literate and had some background with liberal democracy. 
But then, the new immigrants who had come after the 1870s were a much different lot. Some were from China and Japan, but most were from Southern and Eastern Europe. They were either Catholic or Eastern Orthodox. Most were illiterate, and American democracy was as foreign to them as the English language. They were Italians, Croatians, Serbs, Greeks, Russian, Poles, and Jews. They were both push and pull factors that brought them to America. Pushing them out of Europe or Asia ranged from fleeing political or religious persecution, or if you're Jewish, both, unemployment, and desperate poverty. And the pull factors that attracted them to America were just the opposite. They were seeking political and religious freedom, job opportunities, and the promise of prosperity. And that brings us to Dad Jokes in History! Why did the poor Italian singer try to emigrate to America? Why? Because he heard it was the land of opportunity. Opera. Italian singer. Yeah. And we're back. This was the time when the French gifted America the Statue of Liberty to symbolize America as a land of hope, freedom, and promise to immigrants around the world. The Statue of Liberty was dedicated with Emma Lazarus's beautiful words. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, your wretched refuse of your teeming shores. Send these, the homeless, tempest tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. But ironically, to many old stock Americans, a spirit of nativism also arose at this time. They believed that the immigrants arriving were actually exactly like those in Lazarus's poem. The lowest source, the wretched refuse or garbage were coming and simply ruining the country. The nativists blamed immigrants for urban problems like crime and corruption, for lowering wages, stealing jobs, and not Americanizing fast enough. And worst of these sentiments were targeted at the Chinese. And the Chinese Exclusion Act was passed in 1893 that banned Chinese immigration, the only group to be specifically prohibited with legislation. So this all begs the question, was America really the golden place of opportunity that the immigrants imagined? Now, no two immigrant stories are the same, but it's absolutely true that America did offer opportunity and a better life for millions, despite whatever hardships that they faced when they arrived. One Polish immigrant sent home a letter saying simply, we eat here every day, but we get only for Easter back in Poland. Or from Maria Tin, another Polish immigrant. So at last I was going to America, really, really going at last. The boundaries burst, the arch of heaven soared, a million suns shined out of every star. The wind rushed in from outer space, roaring in my ears, America, America. And so long as we're on the quote train, I just got one more that's my absolute favorite from an unknown Italian immigrant. I came to America because I heard that the streets were paved with gold. When I got here, I learned three things. First, the streets were not paved with gold. Second, they were not paved at all. Third, I was expected to pave them. Ain't that brilliant? And most of these immigrants lived in dumbbell tenements called human warehouses. Tenements were rundown apartments in poor neighborhoods that just packed in people. Most were 25 feet wide and five stories tall where four families might share one floor with one sink. If you thought sharing a shower with two siblings was tough, imagine one sink between four families. Worse yet, with few windows, there was little fresh air or natural light. And this caused a major problem for Jacob Reese because he could not get a decent photo in the stark darkness. So Reese had been hired by the New York Tribune as their police reporter and had to cover the most crime-ridden areas of New York City. He witnessed not just widespread crime, but also widespread corruption on the police force as well. And we're going to be getting into that in the next episode, so tune in then. Working amidst the worst of urban squalor, he became horrified by how so many people lived in America. In such filthy, congested, and unhealthy conditions, he needed to act. He first published articles for magazines, hoping to stoke America's conscience and churn them to action. But his sketches and his words alone had little effect. But photographing the tenements and dark alleys was nearly impossible due to the lack of light. But in 1887, technology for flash photography was invented and armed with flash photography, Reese went to work. And he eventually printed his photographs in his book, How the Other Half Lives. And in 1890, middle and upper class New Yorkers finally were exposed to the misery of so many who were living just miles away. 
They saw the cramped rooms stuffed with people, tiny apartments used as sweatshops, dungy apartments, men squatting below garbage dumps, and living amidst hazardous waste. Reese, as you can imagine, had a soft spot for the plight of children in the city. Some who slept in the streets, like these huddling a grate for warmth, or those just left alone to find trouble in the back roads. Reese wrote, Yet as I knew, that dismal alley with its bare brick walls between which no sun ever rose or set was the world of those children. It filled their young lives. Probably not one of them had ever been out of sight of it. Is it any wonder that infant caskets were an industry in cities at this time? Reese's photos became documents into the depths of the darkest dens in Gotham. One of his most famous photos was Bandit's Roost, showing a gang, several wanted for murder, in an alley off of Mulberry Street where he worked. With his flash photography, Reese was bringing light to shine onto the injustice that so often grows in the shadows. How the Other Half Lives sold 28 million copies, and one copy landed on the desk of the newly appointed Civil Service Commissioner of New York City, a courageous reformer named Theodore Roosevelt, who sent a personal letter to Reese, saying, I've read your book and I've come to help. Both Reese and Roosevelt in the next decade would help to usher in the progressive movement that sought to address the horrible side effects of industrialization and urbanization. And within two decades of publishing his book, the worst of New York slums were torn down. Building codes would be passed to improve safety and health and living conditions. All of New York City's schools would be required to have playgrounds, and all apartments would eventually have toilets and showers. So I hope Reese's story reminds us to bravely look at those who are the most vulnerable amongst us and who many have turned a blind eye to. And if it can make us grateful for small things like a shower or a toilet, then ain't it lovely studying history? So thanks for engaging in some today. This has been History for Humans. All right, thanks so much for watching the episode. I really hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, could you click the thumb that looks like this and hit the subscribe button? And for teachers and homeschool parents, I have lessons and resources that go with all of my episodes on my website, historyforhumans.com. That's historyforhumans.com. So save yourself a lot of time, energy, and stress and cut out the lecture and just enjoy exploring history with your students. And if you're doing the learning activity, which is found on my website, hang out because we got instructions in just a sec. All right, we got a great one for you today. You're gonna to be doing a mini DBQ. That is a document-based question. So you're gonna be analyzing a few primary sources. One is a diagram of a tenement. There's a juicy excerpt from Reese's book, How the Other Half Lives, and then some photographs. For each one, you're gonna answer a couple of comprehension questions, and these questions are just gonna ensure that you're gonna be ready to answer the inquiry question in two to three paragraphs. The question is very similar to the exploration question in this story lecture, but but armed with primary sources, you're gonna have more ammunition to attack the question and develop your own creative and original response to it. So go into each document curious and consider what does this reveal about the people living in American cities and be brave enough to come to an original answer. All right, hope you enjoyed and act like astronauts on this one and rock it.